My name is Chris Johnson. I'm the Freeman Chair in China Studies here at CSIS. I want to thank everybody for coming out on a glorious day, <laughs> right before a holiday weekend. Um, we're very honored to uh, have speaking today Barry Naughton. Uh, and Barry uh, is, a, of course, a professor at the University of California, San Diego, been studying and analyzing the Chinese economy since the early 1980s. Uh, he published his comprehensive study, The Chinese Economy, Transitions and Growth in 2007, and it has been translated into Chinese and Korean. His first book, Growing, Growing Out of the Plan, Chinese Economic Reform, 1978 to 1993, won the uh, Masayoshi Ohira Memorial Prize. More recently, Naughton has published and edited volumes of essays by Wu Jinglian, China's foremost reform economist, called Wu Jinglian, Voice of Reform in China. In 2015, Cambridge University Press is publishing his co-edited volume, State Capitalism, Institutional Adaptation, and the Chinese Miracle. Uh, Naughton publishes extensively in top economic and social science journals, and he also publishes regular quarterly analysis of Chinese economic policymaking online at the China Leadership Monitor. And of course, uh, Barry's also a professor at University of California, San Diego, my own alma mater, <laughs> and a very close personal friend, so I'm really pleased to have you here, Barry. Um, we're also joined by Tom Orlick, and he is uh, Bloomberg's chief Asia economist based in Beijing. He leads a team providing in-depth analysis of Asia macroeconomic data and policies and how they will impact financial markets globally. So how we're going to do this is Barry's going to come up and uh, give us a formal presentation, and then Tom will comment on that presentation, and then we'll open it up to the floor uh, for questions and answers. Thanks very much. Barry, please. Thanks. <clears throat> I guess I'm mic'd, right? Can everybody hear me okay? With the, okay, great. Uh, so it's, it's an enormous pleasure to be here. It's actually my first visit to CSIS, so it, it means a lot to me personally. They've also, uh, I have to put in a very, thank you, very brief advertisement. CSIS has given us the first uh, opportunity to showcase the new name we have for the, what used to be the Graduate School of International Relations and Pacific Studies. It is now the School of Global Policy and Strategy. We just want you to know that we are still Pacific focused, and we have a great China group, and uh, invite everybody to come out and visit us. The sky is, in fact, just as blue as it looks in that picture, <laughs> and, uh, and, I, and I hope you'll join with us. I want to say uh, a couple of things about a giant topic today, which is, of course, China's economic reforms under Xi Jinping. And I want to start out, the first thing to say here is, is I think, something blindingly obvious, but still needs to be said. And that is that the economic reform program that Xi Jinping is carrying out is real. There's actually something here, something big, something important for us to talk about. I sometimes feel a little frustration because I feel that our view of China, China is so big and so, so complex. Of course, we naturally want handles, simplifying handles to understand things. But at the same time, our, our conception often lags behind a little. In my personal view, under the Hu Jintao, Wen Jiabao administration, economic reforms really ground to a halt, kind of stagnated. And it took us years to incorporate that recognition into our understanding of China. Today, we see dramatic, multifaceted economic reform initiatives underway. And again, there's a little bit of a lag, I think, as it takes us time to grasp how wide ranging and how important some of these changes have the potential to be. But at the same time, I don't want to come across as somebody who's just thoroughly optimistic about China's economic reforms, as if this somehow, once the decision had been made to adopt some kind of economic reform program, that that inevitably meant China would move in a direction that we can foresee, and even necessarily a direction that we would consider positive and desirable. On the contrary, I think it's a much more complex situation. And to me, I try to encapsulate some of the, the uh, the complexity by again stressing something that on the one hand is again blindingly obvious and that is this is an author authoritarian top-down reform program. Everybody sees the authoritarian nature of Xi Jinping's rule in many many different dimensions. I don't have to talk about it here. But in terms of economic reform that means that some of the aspects of economic reform are different the way it unfolds is different from some of the reform programs that we've seen in China in the past. And just to, to emphasize one point right at the outset, that means that the role of 
grassroots incentives in carrying out the reform program is very different today than it was in the 1980s or 1990s. That is to say, in previous waves of reform in China, a great deal of the action has come through uh, decentralization, opening up initiative on the bottom, letting policies percolate up from the bottom. And that aspect of policy making and policy implementation is much less prominent under Xi Jinping than it was under some of the earlier leaders. And that means the dynamics are different, the problems are different, the sequence of events is different. It also means that the natural objective we have Xi Jinping and Li Keqiang said before they came to power, they called for a top-level design of reform. But in fact, what we see is a situation where the leader retains this discretionary power to the very last minute. And that's inconsistent with a blueprint that really lays out exactly what's going to be done and what's going to happen. Um, instead, we see a mechanism for implementing reform, and then a very complex process uh, by which implementation percolates through the system depending upon what the issue is, depending upon who has ownership of that issue, depending upon what kind of resources they have to enforce compliance. One of the most obvious examples of this, uh, the way this type of dynamic is playing out in a clear issue area is coming with state enterprise reform right now. Because one of the remarkable things that's happening is, on the one hand, the Xi leadership team is talking about a, 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 you know, a very complex, potentially meaningful restructuring of the state sector. It hasn't progressed very far. At the same time, they've also passed a rule that says managers of state-owned firms, including state-owned banks, including even the state-owned sovereign wealth fund, should be paid as bureaucrats, meaning that managers of these large state-owned firms are taking huge pay cuts, even as they're suffering from the impact of an anti-corruption campaign and all kinds of other forms of surveillance and politicization of the economy. Is that consistent with economic reform? It's hard to know. Is it consistent with this stage of state-owned enterprise reform? That's hard to know as well. So when we look at how reforms are taking place, I think it's very important for us to avoid the mistake that says, oh, once you have an authoritative boss who's committed to this, then it becomes easy. That's not true, hmm. right? Authoritarian systems don't work that smoothly. If they did, we'd live in a very different world. But the simple fact that you have an authoritative boss with a commitment to reform doesn't necessarily mean that reforms will succeed or that they'll go smoothly. So instead of a top-level design for reform, what we have is a mechanism. I think most of you are familiar with this. This is the leadership small group for deepening comprehensive economic reform. But in a way on this graph, so this shows sort of the structure of it. Of course, you know who the chair of it is. Obviously, it is Xi Jinping himself is the chair. But I really want to direct your attention to two numbers here. The first is 336. That's the to-do list that came out of the third plenum in 2013. Right, that big, comprehensive, bold statement of reforms at some point was boiled down into a to-do into a list. It had 30, 336 different initiatives on it. And those initiatives are disaggregated to subgroups, right, of which the most important is this economic system and ecological civilization. What a term, wow, <laughs> All right, subgroup that has 118 initiatives to take care of. And you know, when we say initiatives, this doesn't mean you know, pick up your dry cleaning today at, on your way to work. <laughs> this means you know, restructure the fiscal system, that's one initiative, and you know, create a new uh, 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 international payment system is another initiative. So this is incredibly dispersed and wide-ranging uh, set of objectives. And, we can see the uh, 
you know, you know, those were drawn up at the end of 2013. Last week, the, the old planning commission, the National Development and Reform Commission, published their key points of work for this year. And it's, it's got just as many things in it, you know. It's got hundreds of items in it, including at least 50, by my count, major new documents that NDRC is supposed to uh, preside over to be produced during this year of implementation. So in other words, we've got a pipeline that's full of half done, and in some cases, half baked items that are working their way through the system, right? And, you know, some items, we see a strong push, giving the support of the top leaders to an individual uh, reform measure. But there are also scores of measures out there that are sort of languishing with partial support or with the leadership more naturally kind of holding back and waiting to see if they can assemble some kind of consensus. If it comes together and there's enough buy-in, then boom, they'll push it forward. That makes it very difficult for us to track the different cases and understand what's happening overall with the reform process. So I want to take an example or two. And the examples I'm taking, obviously I'm choosing them because I think they're important. But as you'll see, they're also, they retain the same complex mixture of ambition, achievement, and failure that I think we see in the reform program overall. So let me start with my first example, which is the restructuring of local government debt. Now, first of all, notice something right away that's kind of peculiar. I just laid out this story about this big institutional mechanism to carry out reform, the leadership small group, and then I go to this important reform example. And does this important reform example actually come out of the leadership small group system? Well, yes, in a way, but really when you dig into it, it's more of a case of a single dedicated civil servant, the Minister of Finance, Lo Jiwei, somebody who's been committed to reform for decades and is now finally in a position of power. So essentially, he's got this program, and Xi Jinping and Li Keqiang nod their heads and say, yeah, do it. Right? So that's what, what drives this forward. So Lo Jiwei advances this extremely ambitious program during 2014. He says, we're going we're gonna to audit all of the local government debt. We're going to cap it so that local government financing vehicles will no longer have the ability to take out additional debt, except through a, a, a clear set of procedures. And then perhaps most critically, a certain portion of the existing debt will be swapped for bonds. That is, new bonds will be sold new, you know, essentially the equivalent of municipal debt in our system will be sold onto the marketplace, uh, and this will be the beginning of the whole conversion of the program. Now, let me stress how, uh, how ambitious this is, because it does at least three big and really important things, right? It, it addresses this potential financial crisis, the real, the very real danger that China's excess lending over the past five years will, resent, will result in some kind of serious financial disorder, maybe even a panic, capital flight, et cetera. That's a real threat. Everybody knows it's a possibility. This is the first time that the system has really grappled head on with the bad debt problem and started to take measures to tackle it. So it's absolutely fundamental in that sense. Second, of course, it's also part of a program to improve the finances of local government by reducing their interest payments. Some estimates are that local governments today pay maybe as much as 8% on their very large debt because they have to, they're in a situation where they're forced to roll over bank loans. They sometimes have to have recourse to these off the books shadow banking facilities to get access to credit. So we don't know for sure, but certainly it's a, above 6% and might be as high as 8%, whereas these new bonds would be substantially less, perhaps three and a half to 4%. And 
Also, in terms of its reform content, right, a very, very important objective of this is that these new bonds, these new local government bonds, would then become a part of a rapidly growing diversified bond market that is an absolutely crucial part of creating a new modern financial system. The bond market's grown dramatically over the last few years. There's already 3.4 trillion renminbi worth of so-called chengto or urban construction bonds. So it's a very you know, significant, that's just, it's 5% of GDP. It's nothing compared to bond market in, in our economy. But from nothing, it's growing significantly. We've got the beginnings of a diversified uh, bond market in China of government bonds, bank bonds, and enterprise bonds. So that's a very, very important part of the overall transition to a more marketized economy. And again, part of this program is that the people who were buying bonds would be not only banks, who are the main actors today, but would also include pension funds, insurance companies, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, when you look at this program, you've got to say, this is really serious both in terms of the willingness to tackle the core problems, the core things that threaten the Chinese economy today, and in terms of the direction it's going in terms of a much more sophisticated and market-based financial system. Uh, I'm going to skip, skip that slide because it's too abstract. <laughs> um, but here's the catch. It failed. And I mean, it really failed. I don't mean just implementation has been difficult. In some sense, every strand of this proposal fell short. So in the first place, Lo Jiwei said, all right, we need the local governments to report their debt. And they did. They essentially said, ah, this is the last chance for somebody else to take over responsibility for my debt. So they reported one point, uh, sorry, 16 trillion, uh, which was much more than people expected and much more than the system was willing to handle. So Lo Jiwei said, go back, <laughs> look again, figure out how much debt actually should belong to different kind of commercialized entities that can take over responsibility themselves so it doesn't have to be government debt. And they had to set up a whole no new program where the, uh, the Bank Regulatory Commission and the banks and the NDRC and the Ministry of Finance all together we're going to do a much more detailed audit in order to try and control the scale of the, uh, in order to control the auditing process uh, of the debt. In other words, the local governments perceived a potential bailout in this, and so they wanted to <coughs> overstate or at least report as much debt as possible. And then when time came to sell the first batch of these bonds, province of Jiangsu, obviously a relatively rich and sophisticated province, marketed the first batch of bonds in April or late March, and they failed. Nobody bought them. Nobody wanted to buy them, basically because there's already, as I said, there's three trillion in these urban construction bonds that have an average interest rate of 6% and have a kind of implicit local government guarantee. So if you can get a, if you can invest your money at 6% with an implicit guarantee, why would you buy these local government bonds at 3.5% with a, even though the guarantee might be somewhat more formal? So they failed. And then at the end of April, the Politburo met, and the Politburo essentially said, the economy is doing worse than we think. One of the problems with the economy doing poorly is that local governments are somewhat paralyzed. They're not spending money fast enough. Infrastructure projects are not, out, are not building out fast enough. And one of the problems is the high level of uncertainty about financial resources of local governments. So this program really failed, right? It failed perhaps because the design was too sophisticated, perhaps because the, uh, the uh, implementation mechanism wasn't properly thought out, but also because the macroeconomic conditions meant that a debt restructuring that had a contractionary impact 
just wasn't going to fly. Right? With the economy slowing down the way it is, the political leaders backed off their support for it and said, let's do something different. So instead, we got debt restructuring 2.0 which still will convert a trillion renminbi worth of, bond, uh, worth of debt into bonds, but the, the nature of the restructuring is something really completely different. T they took this trillion and they said, well, where did the original debt come from? Right? If it came from this bank, then this bank is responsible for buying the bonds that the debt is going to be converted into. So that's a very different proposition, right? Especially because the interest rate on the bonds was sort of equally low with the interest rate on the bonds in Jiangsu that nobody wanted to buy. But now the, bonds, the banks don't really have any choice but to, uh, but to carry it out. Supposedly, it's a, a negotiation. Supposedly, it's a market-based transaction. But of course, what it really is is a one-on-one -on -one transaction where everybody knows the transaction has to be carried out and where there are guidelines that drive it <clears throat> towards a relatively low interest rate. And then to sweeten it, the central bank agreed that these bonds would serve as collateral for any central bank lending to the commercial banks. So in other words, it's sort of similar to the European system where the European central bank guaranteed to the European commercial banks that they would be able to use Greek debt and Spanish debt as collateral for central government for European bank lending. But that was a better deal for the European commercial banks because that allowed them to buy debt that was high yielding at the time and then use it for collateral and also profit when the interest rate came down. It's a very different deal for the Chinese commercial banks who don't really need collateral right now and who would be forced to buy bonds with a lower interest rate to begin with. In other words, this is a bailout. It's a bailout of the local governments by the banks who don't have any choice but to take the new debt. So this is a very, very uh, substantial change. It's a big deal. And it's also, uh, it also displays the kind of mix of success and failure that we should be looking for as we look at this whole big reform process as a whole. In a way, we can say that the key thing that doomed Lo Jiwei's initial plan to failure was the fact, was the downward pressure on the economy overall. The economy is weakening because of the secular trends towards slowing, but the inflation rate's also dropping because energy prices have been low. So it's clear that optimal macroeconomic policy, this is, this is controversial, but I, think, but I think it's true, optimal macroeconomic policy should become more expansionary. Lo Jiwei's bond swap was moderately contractionary, so that killed it. But in other areas, thanks, in other areas, the need to, uh, the, the opportunity, maybe we should say, to move towards a more expansionary macro policy could also be harnessed in favor of reform. And so while we see this failure on the part of fiscal reforms, when we turn over to financial reforms, we find that this same need to adopt a slightly more, somewhat more expansionary policy creates some opportunities. Because as the central bank pushes to drive down funding costs, it gives them a new kind of leeway. So here's a graph. This is the justification for having a PowerPoint, really, was to <laughs> be able to show this graph. Um, and what it shows on the top is the PVC set benchmark one-year lending rate. And at the bottom black line is the benchmark one-year deposit rate. So if we look over at the left-hand side, what we see is sort of the old system, right? a big gap, 300 basis points, that's three interest, three percent interest, three interest, three percentage points of interest, this sort of enforced gap that provides profit to the banks, which can take deposits at the low rate 
and lend at the high rate. Over the years, the PBC has liberalized the lending rate so banks can lend at higher and different rates. But the deposit rate has not been liberalized until very recently. So look at what's happened in the last year. As the benchmark rate has gone down, the ceiling of what commercial banks can give to depositors has barely changed. Because every time they lower the benchmark rate, they've increased the band mm. so that now commercial banks can give 150% of the benchmark rate to depositors. Why does that matter? It matters for two reasons. One, the spread with the benchmark uh, lending rate has decreased very substantially from 300 to 170 basis points. So there's less of a enforced profitability for banks, which is an enforced kind of taking from depositors. But even more important, as interest rates have fallen, the actual interest rates that the banks give to the depositors, which is shown there way over on the right in that red circle and black diamond, has now fallen below the ceiling for deposit interest rates. Mm -hmm. In other words, deposit interest rates are now deregulated in China. That's a big step forward. That's something the central bank has been trying to do for a decade. And now we finally start to see it as the macro policy shifts towards something more, uh, more liberal. I'm gonna, I won't go through this slide either. You can look at it for your reference later. The point is just these measures of liberalization of financial markets are being accompanied by a broad span of different liberalization measures in financial markets. Just for one major, for instance, the linkages now being established between the Shanghai stock market the Hong Kong stock market, and now the Shenzhen stock market as well, mean that equity markets and these growing bond markets are starting to be linked up in terms of the way demand for funds influences asset pricing in these different markets. They've still got a long way to go, but these are major changes in the direction of creating a modern integrated financial system that is now significantly open to world financial markets as well. So where does that leave us? As you can see, I'm not saying, oh, everything's great, reforms are perfect and underway. But I think we do have to acknowledge there's such a dramatic spectrum of new reforms. I think it makes sense to think of them as already falling into sort of four categories, right? There are some things where reforms are just working, right? The deposit rate liberalization, true. It needs to be sustained when interest rate conditions change. But essentially, if the will is there, we're already there in terms of the deposit rate liberalization has been achieved. There are a lot of other ways where changes are underway. Momentum has been established. We just need to sort of expect these things to continue. Uh, and uh, then we'll, we, 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 should, we should see changes. Reformulation is going to be a huge part of it. Local debt restructuring round one failed, but it's not going away. That's only one trillion out of 15, 16 trillion. You're going to see the next tranche will be handled in a different way, the next tranche in a different way. And I think my expectation would be that particular area, you'd see a process of reformulation uh, that probably will ultimately succeed. And other things certainly are going to fail. For instance, I think urban, the transformation of rural to urban land is something that so far has failed. SOE reform so far has failed. But it's going to be a mixed and complex picture. So my last word then, these changes won't necessarily produce our dream system <laughs> of a market economy in China, especially maybe a fair market economy in terms of the way foreign businesses are treated. But they're already important enough that they're dramatically changing the way this system works, and they're making changes that will uh, continue to be resonant over the next decade and decades as well. I'll stop there and turn it over to Thanks, Barry. Thank you. Thank you.
can do it from there. To you, up to you. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm going to... I'm going to stand up because it lends me an air of greater authority. <laughs> um, so um, thanks very much to, to CSIS uh, for the opportunity to, to speak here. Um, it's, a, it's a great honor for me to be on the same platform as, as Professor Norton. Uh, I moved to China in, in 2007, uh, and the one book on the Chinese economy which came with me in my suitcase was uh, Barry Norton's uh, book uh, on, the, on the Chinese economy. It still has a prominent position on my bookshelf. Uh, unlike my book on, on Chinese economic indicators, which I'm currently using to prop up a, a wobbly table. Um, <laughs> so um, I'm China's, uh, I'm Bloomberg's chief Asia economist. Uh, I'm part of a, a global team of economists at, at Bloomberg uh, that started to, to produce um, systematic and detailed coverage uh, of major economies. So I cover China, my team cover uh, Japan, India, and other countries in Asia and we have colleagues in Europe and the US uh, doing a similar job. Um, so uh, as I said, I've got a huge amount of respect for uh, Professor Norton. Um, that said, um, you guys didn't take a, take a morning out of this beautiful sunny day to hear us agree with each other. Um, so I'm gonna do my absolute best uh, to try and pick a few holes in his argument. Um, first of all, um, I'm gonna try and sound a slightly more optimistic tone um, on the, uh, on the reform agenda, um, and then I'm going to speak a little bit about why, even though I think we can be optimistic about reform, um, that still doesn't make us optimistic about where China's growth is headed. Um, so first of all, um, Professor Norton mentioned uh, the absence of a, of a blueprint for reform um, and the continued role of discretion at the top of China's decision-making uh, system uh, as a problem. Um, and I, I, I share that view. I think, I think that is an issue. But I think it's also important to remember where we came from. Uh, if you go back in time uh, to the Hu Jintao, Wen Jiaobao administration, the concern was really about leaders who were too consensus-oriented, leaders who didn't have the willpower to take on vested interests and push through tough reforms. Well, if that was the problem, then under the Xi Jinping, Li Keqiang administration, I think we can all agree that it's been resolved. Now we have leaders who are tough, who are muscular, who are willing, demonstrably willing, to take on the vested interests and push through painful reforms. So yes, there isn't an overall blueprint, but relative to where we were um, with consensus-orientated leaders who, who couldn't take the difficult decisions, uh, I think we're in a, we're in a better position. Um, secondly, um, uh, Professor Norton uh, mentioned uh, the absence of um, bottom-up initiative. Um, I guess we sort of thinking back to the 1980s where land reform didn't come from Deng Xiaoping, it came from the sort of uh, autonomous innovation of, of China's farmers. Um, so I have a slightly different view on this uh, based on what I see in innovative companies in China using technology to respond to the demands of consumers in a way which has a reforming impact on China's overall economy. Um, so let me give you a couple of examples of what I mean by that. Uh, it's very hard to get a cab in Beijing. There aren't enough taxis. Um, and the reason there aren't enough taxis is because the government regulates the fare for taxi drivers at a level which is unattractive. So people don't want to work in the industry. Now, that problem has started to get better. The problem has started to, to, to be solved. And it hasn't been solved by the government changing the regulation on taxi fares. It's been solved by companies like Didi Dacha, um, which is kind of like a Chinese Uber, which has created an app which lives on people's smartphones and which they can use to summon a taxi and to incentivize the taxi driver by offering them a tip. So the government hasn't changed the regulations, but an innovative private sector company has taken advantages of changes in technology to take the system a step forward. That's one example, but you can also see perhaps more significant examples in areas like telecoms, where Tencent's Weixin application is changing the way people communicate, taking revenue away from the big Chinese state-owned telecom companies, 
making communication easier and cheaper uh, for Chinese citizens. Um, or in the banking sector, um, where money market funds uh, like Alibaba, Alibaba's money market fund, are taking funds away from the banks. And even before the, uh, the significant moves on interest rate liberalization, which Professor Norton, uh, I think, completely rightly identified as a, as a major step forward, even before that happened, these innovative private sector players like Alibaba's money market fund were taking funds out of the banking system, allowing customers to manage those funds over the internet, which, as any of you who've been to a Chinese bank knows, um, is a huge improvement, um, and offering them a market set interest rate. So on the question of whether reform is centralized or decentralized, yes, Beijing continues to call the shots on shifts in the regulation, but I think if you look at what's happening in the real economy, you do see these innovative private sector firms using technology to address consumer uh, needs, and that having a significant impact on everything from taxis in Beijing, to the way people communicate, to the way people manage their finances. Um, so um, that said, um, I'm just going to make a couple of remarks on, um, well, I guess we could say I'm, I'm a little bit optimistic on the reform agenda. Um, but I'm also a little bit pessimistic on the outlook for growth um, for a couple of reasons. Uh, firstly, I, I think people, people wonder whether China's economy is going is to make a, is going to continue growing at a reasonable pace or slow sharply. I, I think that's the wrong question. China's economy has already slowed sharply. If you look at the real growth rate, back in 2007, the economy was growing at 14% a year. Now it's growing at 7% a year. If you look at the nominal growth rate, which is more relevant for understanding corporate profits, in 2007, we were growing at 21%. Now we're growing at 5.8%. So there's just been an extremely pronounced slowdown in China's growth. And that's starting to show up in the places where you'd think it would show up. Iron ore prices, for example, are extremely low compared to, to where they were a year ago. Now, a, a lot of people um, doubt the, the validity of, of China's official data. Um, and uh, and so, so we also look at a range of alternative measures of China's growth. Uh, I just completed that exercise um, for, the, for the first quarter uh, yesterday. Uh, so we look at things like electricity production, land sales, um, Macau gambling revenue, uh, same store sales for Yum, who have a lot of Kentucky Fried Chicken restaurants in China, um, volume at Shanghai's ports. Um, and all of these measures, every single one of the measures I just mentioned, is either contracting or growing in the very low single digits. So based on that, I think there's some cause for concern that not only has China's growth slowed extremely sharply over the last few years, but that it continues to um, slow, it continues to slow um, at, a, at a reasonably rapid pace. Um, so finally, uh, just a couple of thoughts on what growth might look like if the reform agenda succeeds. So for me, I think even a successful reform agenda is not going to support growth if the fundamental drivers of demand are not there. By fundamental drivers of demand, I'm talking about exports, investment, and consumption. And across each of those areas, I think there's reason for pessimism. Uh, so China is already the world's number one exporter. They've also seen very strong appreciation of the yuan and strong increases in labor costs over the last few years. Now, what that means is that China has limited room to grow its share of global trade and problems with competitiveness, which impede its capacity to take market share. So even a successful reform agenda isn't going to do much to grow exports. How, how about investment? Well, investment has been the, the workhorse of China's growth um, for the last decade, um, and um, that's been very successful as a way of, of keeping, keeping growth strong through the financial crisis, um, but it's also brought problems. Industrial overcapacity, overstretched banks. So what we're seeing now in the last few months is that 
even as the PBOC has started reasonably aggressively cutting interest rates, we're not seeing bank lending accelerating, and we're not seeing business investment accelerating. So I think uh, I can, uh, the reform agenda, and I think interest rate liberalization has really been one of the successes, is going to mean more efficient allocation of investment. But against that, we have to set the headwinds of industrial overcapacity and overstretched banks. And I think that means that we can't be too optimistic about the capacity of investment to drive growth either. Finally, consumption. Um, consumption is where everyone wants to see the Chinese economy moving. Rebalancing is the, the, the order of the day in Beijing. Um, and I think of the, of the drivers of growth, the, the area where we can be most optimistic um, is, is the consumption story. But I think it's also important to remember that households work in the industrial sector and they own real estate. And so the slowdown in the industrial sector and the fall in house prices has a real impact on household welfare. Wage growth is slowing. Households have the majority of their assets, the majority of household wealth is in real estate. So as house prices start to come down, we see a negative wealth effect on China's consumers. Uh, and what that means is that the slowdown in investment, the slowdown in trade is not going to, see, not going to leave the household sector unaffected. It's not reasonable to expect extremely rapid growth in wages, extremely rapid growth in household wealth, and so extremely rapid growth in consumption when the rest of the economy is not doing terribly well. Um, so with that, um, I'll uh, return to my seat and, uh, and back to you. Great. Thanks, Tom. Great. Appreciate it. OK. Um, we're going to dive in with the audience here in a moment, but I'm going to kick off with a couple of questions that uh, maybe try to bring that very focused discussion up a little bit um, and give you guys some things to chew on before we turn over to the audience. Um, the first one is you see a lot now of discussion when we look at what's happening in the economy, especially with the slowdown that Tom was highlighting, uh, comparisons to Japan in the 1990s um, and, and even going forward. So how similar are the economic reform challenges, would you say, that the Chinese are facing now to those that Japan faced? And would you say, is Xi Jinping's task easier, more difficult, uh, something in between? And then the second one is, uh, we talked a little bit about this, Barry, in your presentation, the whole issue of the mechanism, right, for uh, how to implement these reforms. I wondered if maybe you could drill down a little bit on that and tell us a little bit about your view of the economic experts that are involved in analyzing and making these policies now. Uh, there's obviously a lot of discussion about how the mainline ministries don't seem to be playing the role they used to uh, in the past, and that there are these kitchen cabinet advisors, if you will, that are extraordinarily influential. I wonder if you might uh, compare those with similar individuals, say, from 10 to 20 years ago, or the Zhu Rongji period of reform, something along those lines. What's your impression of uh, how they think? And is there a relative consensus among them, or are there really fierce debates on uh, these policy issues? Thanks. I guess I'll stand up. I know, I know I'm not qualified to have this glass of water, but uh, let me take a quick sip on it. Just thought I'd put it at a safe distance. <laughs> oh, thanks for those great comments. I, th I think I, I pretty much agree with most of the things that, that Tom said. Uh, in particular, I mean, the downward pressure on the economy is, is really serious. Um, and I guess that's a good way to sort of bring in Japan, too. I think the, you know, when we, when we compare China and Japan, uh, China is exiting its miracle growth period. I think there's no question about that. And, and so the similarities with Japan, actually not so much in the 1990s, but in 1973, mm. and Korea in 1987, are, 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 quite, are quite substantial. I think um, there's sort of two reasons why China might be in a little better sh uh, shape, and two reasons why it might actually be in worse shape. China might be in a little better shape, paradoxically, because its incomes are lower. And you know, economists believe in, in a tendency to convergence. And China's income is substantially lower than Japan's was even in 1973. And so there's still you know, many sectors where Japanese companies and businesses 
have uh, strong competitiveness based on uh, lower costs and lower wages in particular. The second reason is just the investment in human capital has been so massive in China. The uh, investment in university education, the number of people coming out with degrees, the number of people going back from after education in the United States, the investment in research and development that's over 2% of GDP. I mean, these, these are real, even, even though, I mean, I have a lot of criticisms of the way these policies are carried out uh, so that they might be less efficient in terms of the way some of these uh, knowledge resources are used, but still, there's still a huge investment in these knowledge resources. On the other hand, China's labor force changes are even more rapid, more dramatic, more concentrated than the changes in Japan and Korea. Uh, in the sense that if we think of the high growth period as basically ending when surplus labor is mopped up, when the, the pool of underutilized labor in the economy in rural areas and other, other areas are, is finally drawn down, in Japan and Korea that took place at the time of the initial slowdown, but it wasn't for another 20 years that the population started to age and the labor force started to shrink. Whereas in China, these two things are happening together, right? The pool of labor has been, been absorbed and the labor force has already plateaued and is actually declining slightly. And that exerts a kind of downdraft on the economy as we saw in the, in the 1990s. And then also just at the financial mess, is really big, and there's probably going to be some growth costs involved in 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 uh, clearing it up. You know, my take of Japan in the 1990s is the biggest problem that Japan had is that they tried to defer addressing those financial issues for so long, and they just carried this bad debt load for almost a decade before they began to to deal with it significantly. I think that China is going to do a lot better than that. I think that they're going to tackle the bad debt problem more aggressively uh, and that they'll do so more thoroughly. So I don't, I'm not worried about a decade of stagnation in the Japanese sense of the 1990s. But I am worried about uh, short run disruptions to growth caused by the difficulty of re-gearing economic policy and re-gearing development strategy once that miracle growth phase ends. So I very much agree with Tom. I mean, I think our sort of short-run warranted growth rate, I think, is below 7%, quite, you know. And I'd love to, so I guess I would give Chinese policymakers credit for uh, recognizing that there is a new normal, that, that, you know, we don't, we're not trying to sustain growth at the super high levels that it was at before. There is a new normal, but I think we'd have to say the new normal isn't normal yet, right? <laughs> We're not actually at the new normal yet. And my guess is if, if they were listening to me, which they're not, uh, I would say uh, you know, target 4 or 5% growth for this year in order to give the economy a more space to make the kinds of reorientation that's necessary, even if you're hoping to come back up to a 6% uh, sustainable growth over the next few years. That would, would be what I'd uh, like to see. I guess Chinese economists don't have consensus on that, right? I mean, quite a few Chinese economists, most famously Lin Yifu, uh, Justin Lin, thinks that China's capable of 8% growth. Uh, I, don't, I don't quite get it. I, I don't see how, how he gets there. Uh, and in any case, we've certainly seen in the most recent uh, Politburo meeting this determination to try and keep, keep growth higher. So I think that's, that's, very, uh, that's very much uh, you know, it's, it's hard enough to know, you know, what the sustainable target growth rate should be. I mean, if we think of macro policy as trying to adjust uh, money supply and interest rates to come as close as possible to that sustainable warranted growth rate, it, we don't even know what that warranted growth rate is in China, and there's not even agreement about it. So um, it's, it's certainly a, a, a factor that makes setting economic policy properly much, much more difficult. Um, you know, in terms of the, the people who are advising Xi Jinping, I mean, it's funny because, of course, the, probably the two most important 
operational, you know, hands-on policy makers are central bank head Zhou Xiaotuan and Minister of Finance Lo Jiwei. Well, if you say how different are they from the advisors of the 90s and the 80s, they are, the, say, they are the advisors <laughs> of the 90s and 80s. They're, they're the same people. Um, and they, um, I think it's fair to say that their advice was mostly neglected during the, during the Wen Jiabao era, and now they are listened to, uh, and they're in positions of great, great power and responsibility. Um, of course, they don't always agree, uh, and we know, you know, just in precisely in terms of this, uh, this local debt restructuring, uh, there were some real frictions between the two, uh, and I think uh, one hears, and you know, never know. There's such a gossip mill in Beijing, but one hears that uh, that uh, Zhou Xiaochuan was quite frustrated at the the outcome that sort of forced the commercial banks, which are after all part of his portfolio, mm -hmm. to take on responsibility for the local debt, which is Lo Jiwei's portfolio. <laughs> um, but but I think those those things are uh, pretty natural uh, part of the part of the business. Uh, you know, in, uh, in terms of the advisors directly to Xi Jinping, of course. You know, everybody I think is aware, especially in Washington, where people are very attuned to uh, advisors. People have paid a lot of attention to Leo He, who is, of course, um, in that picture that I showed of the leadership small group and the subsidiary group that is responsible for the most of those initiatives. The economist Leo He is the co-chairman of that specialized group. So he's in a very critical position in terms of managing the flow of decision making uh, and being the one who has to decide has, has our policy making on this particular issue you know, reached a mature enough level. They love that, that term. <laughs> they, the, the policy has to mature and then be approved by the top leaders. So he's really sort of the person right there in the cat seat in terms of determining whether a policy has reached the point where the leadership can can approve it and, and push it forward, and I, I can't I can't really detect any major differences in the way he views the world and say Zhou Xiaochuan and Lo Jiwei view the world. They have somewhat different uh, institutional constituencies, but but I think they're they're people whose thinking is easy for other economists to understand. I mean, they're very influenced by economic reasoning. They see things uh, as economic. So I guess the, the one question is, Xi Jinping, who is obviously a politician just down to his toes, <laughs> somebody who has a strong populist sense, uh, not a democratic bone in his body, and not really an economist mindset, but he has so far relied on these economic advisors very strongly. I hope he continues to, mm -hmm. but we don't have any necessary reason to to, to expect uh, that he will, but so far he has. So, great. Yeah. Did you want anything? So, um, just I think on the on the Japan question, um, I think if you look at the the metrics which uh, Professor Norton alluded to, um, GDP per capita, um, urbanization levels, uh, China looks a lot more like Japan in the immediate post World War II era. Um, than it does Japan in 1989 or even Japan in, in 1980. Um, so I think based on uh, the idea of convergence and catching up, um, I think there's some reason for optimism that China is not on the brink of a, of a lost decade. Um, the reason why I, I, I think there's, there's also a reason for a bit more pessimism though, um, and that's, that's for a couple of reasons. Um, so I, re I recently read um, uh, the, the classic study of uh, Japan's economic miracle, um, Mitsi and the Japanese Economic Miracle by, by Chalmers Johnson. Um, and the thing which struck me about it was just that uh, Mitsi, which is kind of like the, the Japanese NDRC, was just a much more efficient development institution um, than anything which existed in China. Um, so China's industrialization has come with rampant overcapacity, with rampant overborrowing. And that's because 
even though the NDRC looks pretty powerful relative to whatever we have in, in the United States or Europe, relative to MITI's capacity to control industrial capacity expansion or industrial borrowing, NDRC is really very puny. Um, so my concern is that China has achieved a moderate level of prosperity in a way which is so much less efficient than what Japan did that that space for growth, um, which it appears to have, uh, will actually turn out to be illusory. Thanks. Okay, we're going to turn it over to the audience now uh, for standard uh, CSIS procedure. If you could uh, announce yourself and uh, what your affiliation is, and do please keep your question in the form of a question rather than a soliloquy. Uh, we're going to go right up here at the front, and please wait for the microphone. Uh, Mike Bosetic, PBS Online News Hour. To what degree does the uncertainty of the purges and the anti-corruption campaign weigh here in the sense that in the best of times it wasn't that risk-taking a society and now there there's must be much more fear of taking uh, risks. And that sort of then plays into your thoughts on Nicholas Lardy's point that a lot of decision making and power has moved from the state to the uh, private uh, private sector. How do you yeah, okay, go for it? Go ahead. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, uh, unquestionably, you know, the anti-corruption campaign and the other thing we don't necessarily think of in the same basket with that, though, is the sudden disruption in terms of what success indicators mm -hmm. are for people, mm -hmm. so that they face not only. Uh, it, it's not just more risky, it's also a lot less fun. <laughs> and, uh, and there's a lot more uncertainty about what they're supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. And you do see, it's funny in some of the things, including that uh, NDRC uh, plan for the year that I just mentioned, uh, you see uh, a, a certain amount of new emphasis on, hey, we really need to tie specific reform objectives to the, you know, the success indicator of local officials sort of more or less officially recognizing that what you're saying is a problem is a problem. That, you know, people are, are dragging their feet because they're not sure what to do. Uh, you know, I guess in terms of, of, of Lardy's book, I think that, you know, it all depends on, on what time framework you're looking at. I mean, he's, the title of the book says it all, right? Markets over Mao, if you're making the comparison <laughs> with 35 years ago, of course, that's absolutely right. I mean, my God, the, the economy is predominantly private, and that's a key driver of, of the success of the economy. I don't think there's any question about that. So, you know, in some ways, I would focus on a slightly narrower time frame. I think there was, there, there has been a, let's say, a consolidation of the state sector over the last 10 years, and maybe a, this is very subjective, so it's really hard to measure, but what you often heard, say, five years ago from people in China was that it was more difficult to do business as a private entity without having some kind of connection or some kind of patron in the government. And so in that sense, that private decision-making had been eroded somewhat. That, that's something I would worry about, but I couldn't prove it. You know, there's no objective indicator that shows that that's true. I'd just build on what Barry said by, by noting that I think this is one of the, you know, we talk about the new normal in the economy. What I find striking is that there's a bunch of new normals <laughs> across a, a yeah. variety of different things. For sure. And one of those is, as you just alluded to, how being a local official has gone from one of the best jobs in China to one of the worst, uh, and you know how difficult that is for them. And, and one of the issues, you highlighted it in your comments, Barry, about the pay for state-owned enterprise managers, and I think we see this also for local officials, where they're, the central message on any corruption and in the frugality campaign is effectively, hey, you know that social contract we've had for the 30, last 30 years where you get paid a poor official salary, but you, you get the home bow, you get you know all these other, that's gone. You're on the emperor's yeah. grain now. And, uh, this is, I think, causing a real serious rethink among smart people just at the time when the rub of these reforms where they really need that technical expertise and so on is, is coming into play. And I think they face a real serious brain drain issue and problem. So um, I have a slightly more optimistic take on the, on the anti-corruption campaign. Um, so I, I would really cast it in terms of uh, Xi Jinping's capacity uh, to push aside the vested interests, which everyone says are the main barrier to reform. 
Um, so if you go back in time to the Hu Jintao, Wen Jiaobao era, uh, everyone said, okay, we'd love to do reform, but the state-owned enterprises, the local governments, they're too powerful, we can't do anything about it. Well, what have Xi Jinping and Wang Qishan done? They've come into power, they've grabbed the head of SASAC, they've grabbed the heads of the major state and enterprises, they've grabbed heads of local government. It's part of the clean governance, anti-corruption campaign, but it also sends a very powerful signal. If you mess with us, if you oppose our efforts on anything, including economic reform, then woe betide you. Um, now, I think that, that there is a, a reasonable concern about what impact this has on China's government system. Does everybody say, the corruption investigators are out there, the safest thing for me to do is to hide under my desk, I'm certainly not signing any bits of paper. Um, and I'm definitely not gonna eat at a luxury restaurant. Um, now, I think intellectually that makes a lot of sense to me, but actually if you, I think if you look at where that should be showing up in the numbers, mm -hmm. I don't see it showing up in the numbers. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the investment data, the only bit of investment that's accelerating is infrastructure investment, mm -hmm. which requires a sign off from local governments. So I don't think they are sitting on their hands. If you look at luxury spending, which is meant to be this index of whether the frugality campaign is taking hold or not, you can certainly find evidence of areas where it's come down. Macau is doing really, really badly. Um, but it's not, a, it's not a universal picture. Uh, I was in Seoul recently. The duty-free store in Seoul is rammed with Chinese luxury shoppers. There was a queue, there was a queue at the Prada store, uh, and I was kicked out for taking a picture of it. Um, <laughs> so um, uh, even though I was using a Samsung phone, which would get me out of the problem. Um, so I, I think the corruption campaign is... is I think there's a positive read on it in terms of its relationship with the, the reform agenda. And I get the point that it could be really confusing and uh, freezing up the government machine. But where I, would look, where I look for evidence of that happening, I don't see it. Uh, in the back there. Thank you. Um, my name is Hong Zhang. I'm a PhD student from George Mason University. So um, for both of you, both of speakers. My question is, to what extent do you think the whole set of financial reforms represent a breakaway from the Chinese model of political economy in the sense that um, in the traditional model, the, the state-owned commercial banks have played crucial roles in providing funds for local governments and to state-owned enterprises for the investment-driven ec economic growth. So now the, the commercial banks are moving toward a more market-oriented direction, and the local governments are also pushed toward a, uh, a more, let's say, more market-oriented uh, oriented fundraising model. Um, so what's the implication for the, for the whole um, political economy? And that would tie back to the, the question of, um, of Lardy's book, which is to what extend the, the state economy still plays a central role in, in, in the Chinese economy and what's the implication for the whole political system? Thank you. In three minutes. Yeah, th <laughs> those, are, those are good questions. But let me, let me specify that there, there are sort of two different questions, right? And so let, let's look at the first one first. I mean, the, if we move away from a system of financial repression where you know, quantitative controls are really used to steer predominantly bank credit to especially privileged beneficiaries. Um, that results in, in, you know, in some change in the allocation of resources. The state doesn't have the same kind of prior claim that, that it used to have. But it doesn't mean that local infrastructure investment has to disappear. I mean, this, the government has lots of money. It has lots of taxation authority. It has lots of uh, of clout in all kinds of different ways. So, so it's, I mean, personally, I would hope that the investment rate would in fact come down gradually over time, several percentage points. Uh, I think that would be consistent with a, a better functioning economy. But, um, but you know, we know that the modern financial systems actually are more efficient in a way that kind of gives you a percent or two of a GDP, you know, kind of efficiency bonus. Um, so, you know, I think that would be a very positive transformation. The, 
that's still consistent with China still being a very high investment economy in any kind of comparative sense. Um, what was the second part? I didn't catch the second part. Um, <laughs> is it going to change the kind of whole political economy of yeah. China? What? Is it going to, is a liberalized financial system going to change the whole political economy of China? Yeah. Well, so, I mean, there is an argument that a, a modern financial system plus an open capital account can have you know, very fundamental effects, not just on the efficiency of the economy, but also on sort of the distribution of power. People sometimes turn to, say, Indonesia as an example of this. It definitely provides a check on government decision making that, that I think can be quite positive in the Chinese case. So apparently, Lenin said uh, all communist governments need one very large bank. <laughs> um, which, is, which is a great quote, and I, I've always wanted to use it, but I've never been able to find the original <laughs> attribution, so I'm not sure whether he actually said it or not. Um, and, and I think that, that goes to the kind of the evident truth that if you control the flow of credit, that gives you massive influence over a whole range of different things. Um, now, by liberalizing the financial system, um, I think when we talk about the liberalization of the financial system, I think we have to recognize that we're talking about the liberalization of financial instruments. Mm. We're not talking about a shift in the ownership of China's big banks. So ICBC is now gonna be operating in a market-based interest rate system. However, ICBC is still majority owned by the Chinese government. So I think it will continue, it will hopefully operate in a more efficient way, um, but the Communist Party will still have one very large bank. Although, I mean, I guess to me the, the, the main difference is in, in the first system, it's so easy to hide different kinds of costs so that nobody can really perceive them. ICBC, if, if the financial system reforms succeed, yes, ICBC starts out state run, no question about it, but two things are different. One is it has to compete on more or less equal terms and some of the competitors will do better and some of them are private. But the other is that ICBC's bottom line is gonna be increasingly driven by things that ICBC can't control. And so when the government says, hey, by the way, we'd like you to fund this, then ICBC is gonna push back and mm -hmm. say, well, we can't fund that because you know, it's gonna hurt our bottom line, it's gonna hurt our shareholders, including you. Right there on the edge. Good afternoon. Eduardo Santos, uh, Air Force Intelligence Analyst with DIA. Uh, my question is, uh, with China's economy slowing down, how do you see it affecting their vision of global economic engagement, uh, for example, in their One Belt, One Road initiative? I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm so, so it, It's uh, with the economy slowing down, how do you see that impacting their global economic engagement, especially under like One Belt, One Road? Yeah, well so far, no impact because the, as, demand, as domestic demand is weak, it means that they, that they have the credit available and the capacity available for dramatic externally oriented initiatives. So in, in a way, you know, one, one road, one belt, or one belt, one road can be thought of as uh, a kind of a domestic stimulus program that provides new markets for Chinese companies. That's not the whole reality, but it's so it's very consistent with uh, the needs of the domestic economy. So I think one of the obvious things, so a couple of obvious points to make. Uh, firstly, it's slower growth from a significantly larger base. Mm. So 7% growth today from China is a bigger incremental contribution to global demand than 14% growth in 2007. Uh, second point to make, is that within, the, um, within that growth, there's clearly a, a progressive rebalancing taking place um, from investment and heavy industry towards consumption and services, and that affects the winners and losers in the rest of the world from China's growth. In the past, the winners were Chilean <laughs> copper mines and Australian iron ore mines. In the future, it's far more likely to be um, U.S. soybean farmers, 
or manufacturers of luxury brands. And we're already seeing that transition taking place. Um, the third thing to say um, on, the, on things like the One Belt, One Road initiative, I certainly agree with Professor Norton that this has a kind of stimulative effect um, on China's domestic demand. Uh, I think the other question on a sort of slightly longer term horizon is does this fundamentally change the competitiveness of China's economy relative to other uh, to trade rivals? Hmm. Does if you build significantly better infrastructure connecting China to neighboring countries, connecting maybe connecting China overland to Europe, then has that affected the competitive competitiveness dynamic such that China can start outpricing its trade rivals again? If it does, then I think that would be a, a reason for a little bit of optimism about China's export prospects. I would just add on to that, too. That I think if you look at the strategy, say, in particular with the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank and their ability to draw in a great number of partners, all at a fairly strong entry fee, <laughs> if you will, um, they're getting funds coming in from others, yet they're taking the credit for the initiative. So pretty smart diplomacy in that regard. Right here. <coughs> from a Voice of America. And uh, talking about uh, uh, Chinese reform, uh, the issue of uh, China's SO, uh, SOE uh, state-owned enterprises uh, cannot be avoided. Uh, talking about the reform, uh, people say that to expect uh, China's SOE to reform is something like to, 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 uh, uh, to expect uh, dogs spitting out the meat dumplings in their mouth, as the Chinese, some Chinese would say. Yeah, I, I want to ask you, how do you look at the issue? And here we have examples, such as Alibaba put forward a very good um, product of uh, money market um, product, and quickly, quickly was killed by state-owned banks. So how do you look at the issue? Thanks. Do you want me to have a go? Okay. Um, so, um, firstly, dogs spitting meat dumplings out of their mouth. Colorful analogy. I love it. I'm going to be trying to, my best to work that into all future speaking engagements. Um, so, uh, I think that the second thing to say is that um, I think that in some ways the, the full frontal attack on the privileges of state-owned enterprises has been slow to, has been slow to materialize. Uh, the overall plan for reform of the state sector um, is still, I think it's imminent, but it's still on the drawing board. So you could say that was a lagging part of the, the reform agenda. Um, but um, I think there's, uh, I think there's a, a certain amount of credibility in the view that um, other aspects of the reform agenda are a kind of death by a thousand cuts uh, of China's state-owned enterprises. So things like interest rate liberalization, um, the, the appearance of defaults in the financial sector, including the default on a bond um, from a, from a state-owned firm, uh, reform of energy prices, uh, all of these things are removing the implicit subsidies which support China's state-owned enterprises. Um, so even in the absence of a, of a frontal attack on, on the state sector, these other reforms are starting to change the dynamic. Um, on the money market funds question that you mentioned, uh, I think the remarkable thing there was really that the state banks did push back against uh, the, the birth, the appearance of money market funds, and they lost. Mm. Um, and money market funds continue to grow and, and be dynamic and, and suck funds out of the banking sector. Yeah, no, okay. Um, yeah, Hank. Thank you. Uh, Hank Levine uh, with the uh, Albright Stonebridge Group. Uh, first, a, a brief comment footnote, just thinking the, relative to the previous question, and that is the U.S.-China Bilateral Investment Treaty, if ever completed, would, it seems to me, make a significant contribution to SOE reform or at least increased competition for SOEs because it would require opening up so many sectors that the SOEs are in, so just a random thought. But related to that, I think I saw in, in one of Barry's early slides a reference to the uh, 
to nationalism as an input into reform, and I think in the interest of time, you really didn't discuss it. And I wonder if you could expand on that a little bit, and particularly as it relates to your later comment that the ultimate form of the Chinese economy may not be one that we particularly are uh, want to see, and, and particularly uh, the U.S. business community or the foreign business community may not be, you know, especially thrilled given that the U.S. business community is very focused on the opening side of reform and opening. So I'd be interested in the nationalism question and then how that relates to the progress of kind of the opening side of the reform and opening. Yeah. Great, great question. That's a great question. Um, you know, I wish I had a, a sort of firmer uh, prediction, a clear statement uh, to make about that, and I, and I don't, uh, because you know, I think what we're seeing is the interplay between two, two different instincts, which are both contradictory and occasionally uh, coinciding. Uh, so, you know, it's most obvious, I think, in the sense that this enormous sense that China needs to move into a more innovative economy. And so, you know, on one level, that leads them to support small firms, startups, a much more lively milieu for you know private business and especially entrepreneurial business, and I think there are many signs that, that that's happening. But at the same time, there's this intense paranoia about information technology. This you know still, in spite of all the things they've said, the reality of sort of industrial policy on the ground is still highly interventionist, highly distortionary, and highly anti-foreign. Uh, and so, you know, how do these how do these two things work out? I don't know. And then at the same time, you know, Xi Jinping's drive for China's greatness clearly leads him to support opening the capital account, mm -hmm. having the renminbi play a bigger role internationally, starting with being a member of the special drawing rights basket this fall. Um, but that's leading to, you know, in that sense, it's very positive to economic reform, because I think it gives them a willingness to take risks with financial opening that otherwise they might, they might recoil from. So I just, I, I wish I had a, you know, sort of straightforward, simple takeaway, and I don't, but I do think that the interrelationship inter and interpenetration of, of kind of nationalism and the need to have a strong modern economy, which implies a degree of liberalization and openness, these two things are going to be interacting years I think you I think you can't we can't expect to have a better answer than than what you what you just laid out because it is messy it is messy right I guess I would say picking up on Hank's comment though one thing that's interesting is that BIT may in fact be the best opportunity for the US side to uh, affect the, the arc of the trajectory of the program they're on because I think we could, would all agree that there are certainly people in the system who see the end point being one that we would very much not like right and something like a BIT might be our best opportunity mm -hmm. to you know without with while acknowledging that we can't you know get in their game if you will um, it does perhaps allow us to tilt where they're headed a little bit good any other questions Someone down here, Chris. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Sometimes it's hard to see the people in the front. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you for the, the, the great talk. And I want to return to the a question that uh, Dr. Can Norton. Can you identify yourself, please? Sorry. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm David Cowig. I'm uh, serving, uh, I'm a Foreign Service Officer at the U.S. State Department. Uh, my, my question uh, is, is thinking about the effectiveness of Chinese government, uh, because when I talk with Chinese officials over the years and ask them to explain the system to me, they would often talk about China having the dual leadership system, uh, uh, and, uh, which, which means, of course, that uh, the different government departments working at their level, they're subject to their local government and financing personnel, but they're also responsible in the dual leadership to the next functional, uh, functional level of government above. Uh, but, but then the officials would always uh, caution me, we also have a saying in China, we have measures from above and countermeasures from below. Shang yo zheng si, sha yo And I've also seen a Chinese uh, 
academics criticize this uh, dual leadership system as being a critical weakness for China, meaning that while China is supposedly very centralized, uh, actually because, of course, the part of the leadership at the local level names the personnel and controls the budget, you're going to pay an awful lot more attention to your local leader than to the uh, departmental level above. So I always get the impression in, in my years in China that China is a much more decentralized place than we expect and that the government is actually much weaker. In fact, the, one of the big problems with China is the government is weak, not that even though the Chinese human rights people, uh, of course, have a different perspective, uh, the ability of the central government to impose its policy is actually quite difficult. When I looked at Dr. Norton's slide talking about the local government financial, uh, uh, financial vehicles that was uh, for uh, help helping with finance for local governments, they think, oh, this is another countermeasure from below. Uh, uh, the way which, the, which the local government set up to try to raise some money for themselves. I, I, I worked in Chengdu for five years, and uh, Chengdu, like many of the big cities, they get about one-third of their income uh, from basically confiscating uh, the, the value of real estate from people at the periphery as the city expands. And of course, this is a way for them to capture funds for the development without getting permission from the center. Now, I hope for the good of China question. that things can do better. But uh, the question, I'm sorry, it, it's almost thinking about the political side. Now, this sort of consideration, should I really be uh, keeping this in mind as I think about economic reform, or is economic form a little bit of a a different track. So that, that's what I'm, I'm like, question, okay? So it, it's a great question that is super hard to answer because it, it does, it is so huge, right? I mean, it, and, and um, it is, but you're absolutely right. I mean, talking about local government debt in some level, trying to sweep under the carpet the fact that there are all these important issues about what are the funding sources that local governments have? Is it adequate? Uh, they, of course, have relied tremendously on, on land conversion from rural to urban and development as a key, as a key source uh, of, of revenue. Um, the, but I guess, so, so I agree with you that the interplay between center and local is subtle and complex, and we need to, and we need to think about it all the, all the time. The other thing I'd add is, Local governments in China lack the accountability to an electorate mm. that local governments here have. Mm. And so just allowing, I mean, there's a reason that the system has never allowed local governments to take on debt. <laughs> and they did anyway, and it caused a bunch of problems. And now we're trying to allow them, we meaning they, uh, trying to allow them to take on debt through a, a more transparent, uh, and easily monitored process of issuing bonds, but that's still without the accountability that comes from having a local electorate. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole additional level of, of risk in there because of that. Um, and, um, and, and I wish we had another hour we could talk about <laughs> it. It's a, it's a so um, I think absolutely it's a relevant consideration, um, and it also helps explain why progress has been significantly faster in some elements of the reform agenda than in other elements of the reform agenda. So where have we seen very rapid progress? Well, interest rate liberalization and exchange rate liberalization. Two instruments that are controlled by the central bank in Beijing and where you don't really need to have any debate with anyone at a provincial or a local level or rely on them for any aspect of implementation. Just not to overstate the simplicity too much, but you flip a switch in the PBOC headquarters and it's done. Where have we seen slow and painful progress on reform? Land reform, mm. HUCO reform, dealing with overcapacity, all areas where progress and implementation relies on painfully negotiated agreements with local governments. Great. Okay, well, I think we're at time, uh, and I want to thank you. You've been a very active audience. We appreciate that. And please join me in thanking both Barry and Tom for their excellent. Thank you.